today um, I'm going to talk about the Egyptian Revolution. Um, it's going to be a historical outline. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's also going to include a, a biography of um, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, who was an Egyptian uh, revolutionary. Um, and he was a leading uh, figure in the uh, in the revolution of 1952, uh, which overthrew the uh, uh, monarchy in Egypt. Um, so, to begin, um, yeah, I, I believe this is going to help us understand better understand the current phase of the Egyptian revolution. Um, because, as I see it, uh, this is the second phase of the uh, revolution. The first phase being from 1953 to 1970. Okay. Um, Gamal Abdel Nasser was the second president of Egypt from 1956 until his death in 1970. Nasser was a pivotal figure in the recent history of the Middle East and played a highly prominent role in the uh, 1956 Suez Crisis. Uh, Nasser has been described as the first leader of an Arab nation who challenged what was perceived as the Western dominance of the Middle East. Nasser's legacy was that he fought for Arab unity his whole life uh, since the beginning of the revolution. Though Arab unity did not uh, happen except uh, between Syria and Egypt, for three and a half years, um, he still fought for it. Um, even at the time when there was no official uh, political unity between the governments, there was always unity between the Egyptians and the peoples of the Arab world. Uh, they backed Nasser and Egypt in all of their uh, crises. Um, for that reason, Nasser remains a highly revered figure in both Egypt and the Arab world. Uh, Nasser was born in Alexandria in January 15, uh, 1918. At the age of 15, he took part in anti-British demonstrations. Uh, so very early in his life, he, uh, he started uh, resisting the British uh, uh, colonialism. Those who protested also targeted some in the royal family who, it was believed, uh, tacitly supported the power Britain still maintained over Egypt by its uh, joint ownership of the Suez Canal. It was felt by some that the royal family was willing to accept this as long as no attempt was made by the British to weaken the family's power within Egypt itself. In 1935, uh, Nasser was wounded in the head by the British during an anti-British demonstration. In 1938, uh, Nasser graduated from the Royal Military Academy and joined the Egyptian army. Within the army, uh, Nasser continued with his anti-British activities. Uh, in 1942, an incident occurred which is said to have been the key turning point in Nasser's activities. In February 1942, the British persuaded or forced the King of Egypt, King Farouk, uh, to accept a government that was to be headed by Nahas Pasha. At this time, Britain's power in North Africa was reaching a peak with the defeat of the Africa Corps, and this power was especially felt in Egypt. Nasser was appalled by what he considered to be the interference in the internal affairs of one country by a colonial European power. For the next seven years, uh, he used his influence to persuade officers in the Egyptian army uh, that A, such interference was unacceptable, and B, uh, that all veg vestiges of British rule or influence had to be removed from Egypt. 
during this time, uh, Nasser was stationed as an instructor in the Egyptian Army Staff College. This gave him direct access to young officers who might be more prone to his views when compared to the older officers in the Egyptian Army. Nasser fought in the 1948 war against the newly formed uh, State of Israel. During this war, Nasser held his first proper meeting with those officers who were willing to support his ideas for Egypt. The defeat of the Arab nations in the 1948 war gave an added impetus to their anger, especially as the Egyptian army had to fight with faulty weapons, which was linked to a supply scandal that implicated some members of the royal family. Uh, Nasser was clear in his own mind. The royal family had to go, and Egypt needed a new form of government. He believed that the army had to take a lead in this. The defeat in 1948 strongly affected Nasser. On top of the humiliation of losing the war, Nasser was angered by the apparent corruption within certain sections of the royal family, which it was thought hindered any chance of victory. Nasser decided to basically plot against the king for the sake of Egypt's future. And then, um, in the words of um, an intellectual of the time uh, by the name of uh, Bistoni, this led Nasser to believe that it was inevitable that the army should itself take up the national assignment of salvaging the country from corruption. On July 23, 1952, uh, Nasser helped to organize a revolt against the royal family, and King Farouk was overthrown after a few days of bloodless rebellion. Uh, the actual figurehead for the rebellion was General uh, Naguib, uh, actually Mohammed Naguib, um, who was also in the uh, in the Free Officers, um, uh, which was a military group within the Egyptian army uh, that supported Nasser's ideas. Um, Okay, for, King Farouk fled to Italy, and Mohammed Naguib took over control of the nation. Uh, despite his status within the army, Naguib lacked any political skill, and he lost the support of the younger army officers, those who were so pro-rebellion. Uh, in November 1954, Naguib resigned and retired from public life. As deputy to Naguib, Nasser was the obvious choice to succeed him. This he did on November 17, 1954. Uh, here I'm gonna briefly pause. tide reached its peak in January 1952. General strike, workers and students uh, clashed in the streets against loyalist uh, soldiers, fascist gangs paid by landlords and religious fanatics. Reaction or revolution? Um, in his book, Philosophy of the Revolution, Nasser stated that Egypt could exist again and acknowledged that the main battleground was not in Palestine, uh, but alongside its people. Um, this is uh, referring to his support for uh, the Palestinian liberation uh, movement. Um, 
So as I was saying earlier, uh, the monarchy fell on July 23rd, 1952. Uh, the republic was proclaimed in July 1953. And Nasser shook off the right wing of the free officers, uh, represented by Nequib, and supported by the reactionary Muslim Brotherhood. So this means that there was a left and a right wing um, a faction within the free officers uh, uh, military uh, group, uh, with uh, Nasser being on the left, Nguyen on the right. Um, a year later, in 1953, uh, Nasser ordered the evacuation of British troops occupying the Suez Canal zone. Uh, the economic boycott by Great Britain and the United States um, that followed so that the Egyptian government wouldn't build a gigantic dam at Aswan on the Nile River uh, led to the uh, nationalization of the Suez Canal. Um, to prevent this, Israel allied itself with France and Great Britain uh, in 1956. Nasser defeated the colonial aggression, uh, but Israel occupied part of the Sinai Peninsula. In the fledgling uh, movement of non-aligned countries, uh, which was um, initially set up at the Bandung Conference in 1955, uh, Nasser's victory over Zionism uh, projected him as the undisputed leader of the Arab world. Uh, Cairo became a mecca for a revolution, for the revolutionaries of the Middle East and Africa. Nasser supported the Algerian struggle, um, which um, uh, was fought from 1954 through 1962 um, with the French uh, capitulated in March 1962 um, and welcomed the independence of Tunisia, Sudan, and Morocco in 1956. Um, he also supported um, the uh, Yemen Arab Republic, uh, which was, was also struggling <coughs> to free itself from the monarchy supported by the British. Um, and he uh, he made the decision to uh, militarily support the um, the uh, Yemenese Republicans um, uh, which uh, some have criticized um, uh, because it, it, it wasn't he he wasn't able to to completely uh, defeat the uh, the Yemeni's uh, uh, royalist. Uh, I mean, royal. I mean, the, the forces that, that were loyal to the to the monarchy in Yemen. So, um, but that's a separate uh, issue. I'm going to continue. Uh, the Egyptian Revolution experienced a big quality leap uh, from 1956 to 1958. Uh, then uh, the, the left in Egypt, uh, which due to their opposition to the revolution, um, circulated in the underground clandestinely. Uh, when, I see, when I say left, uh, um, I'm referring to uh, communist uh, left um, groups in, in Egypt. Um, the left concluded that Nasser was more than just a bourgeois nationalist. Uh, the concept of non-alignment against the great powers, uh, uh, with, with them being uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, could very well help overcome the fossilized assumptions of uh, Western Marxism. At the National Congress of May 1962, Nasser read the famous National Action Charter. Uh, the sixth point of the charter concerned the in 
inevitability of the socialist revolution. But five years later, in 1967, Israel became the favorite pawn of the United States in the region. The Zionists reoccupied the Sinai. Nasser ordered several ships uh, sunk in, in the Suez Canal, and the strategic route was rendered unusable what, until it was reopened in 1975. The unexpected death of Nasser in 1970 represented a devastating blow to the Egyptian revolution. Vice President Anwar Sadat succeeded him in office and turned away the course of the, uh, of the process. Um, at the Camp David Accords in 1979, Sadat was subordinated to Israel and Washington DC in the Middle East. He didn't freely get away with it. Accused of traitor and Zionist lackey, Sadat was assassinated in 1981 by the Muslim Brotherhood. And the tyrant Mubarak, chief of the police, rose to power. So that, that's a brief uh, background to the, uh, to the uh, Egyptian revolution uh, of 2011. Um, So the potential of this second phase of the Egyptian revolution is seen without the burden of the first. When I say burden, I mean the historical burden uh, of the first revolution, the first stage from 1953 to 1970. And Nasser's legacy disappears in the analyses that associate rebellion uh, with the power of uh, the new communication technologies like Twitter, Facebook, uh, and other social networks. Um, did the consciousness of Arab peoples begin with the internet? The various news agencies imagine that the current uprising is not against Washington DC, but against the ugly Mubarak, who is now history due to the fighting spirit endurance of the Egyptian people. He has now been replaced, uh, for the time being at least, um, by the torturer Omar Suleiman. Um, and when I say that I, I'm referring to his, uh, to his past as the uh, uh, spy chief of, uh, of Egypt from uh, 1993, through 2011, um, he was head of the General Intelligence Services, um, closely collaborating with uh, CIA um, in extraordinary renditions after 2001, um, where uh, it's, it's been found that he personally tortured um, And um, the important thing to, well, the important thing is to talk about democracy and not imperialism in a country that for over 30 years has represented the U.S. interests uh, in the region. Uh, there is also no doubt that the driving force of the people that call out enough and leave now increases when those above cannot, and those below don't want. But to assume that without leadership their energy will blow steam continuously is much like uh, believing in perpetual motion. Insurrections are abundant, but revolutions are rare. Okay, and um, I 
against, along with, but never without. The most re remarkable rebellions have always had to contend with constituted armies. And so when faced with, uh, with the demonstrations, guerrilla actions, and strikes that erupted after the military defeat of Egypt in the first of the Israeli wars of 1948. Um, uh, that, that, that's how uh, Gamal Abdul Nazar and Mohammed Naguib uh, uh, formed this military group within the Egyptian army called the Free Officers. Um, which uh, I've already covered uh, earlier. Um, so other than that, I would like to um, uh, talk about some of the causes of the Suez Canal War of 1956. Um, in 1956, the Suez Canal was nationalized by, by Gamal Abdel Nasser. The Suez Canal Crisis of 1956 effectively ended the political career of uh, Sir Anthony Eden, um, but it served to greatly advance the already very high standing Nasser had in the Arab world. However, what were the causes of the 1956 Suez Canal Crisis? Britain had ruled Egypt for all of the 20th century. This gave Britain joint control over the Suez Canal, along with the French, which had been described as the jugular vein of the empire. The Suez Canal cut a vast number of miles off of a sea journey from Europe to Asian markets and vice versa, and made a journey around the volatile Cape of uh, Good Hope unnecessary. However, the British presence in Egypt was not welcomed by many Egyptians as they were made to feel second-class citizens in their own country. The Middle East was a key area within the Cold War context, and within the Middle East, the Suez Canal was seen as vital. By 1951, the British had 80,000 troops stationed along the Suez Canal, making it the largest military base in the world. To many in Britain, the Suez Canal was a sign of Britain's overseas power. To many Egyptians, it was an emblem of an empire that harkened back to former times that many believed should have gone when World War I, no, when War, sorry, when World War II ended in 1945. Egyptians needed permission from the British to even go near the canal, and resistance to the British occupation of Egypt quickly grew. Colonel Nasser wanted to take advantage of this situation. First, he was aware that many Egyptians were deeply unhappy with the British being in Egypt. Second, he was also aware that corruption was rife in senior positions within Egypt, and this was most epitomized by the lifestyle of King Farouk. Nasser founded the three officers Members of it wanted to overthrow, wanted the overthrow of old Egypt to be followed by the removal of all British influence in Egypt. By 1952, attacks on British troops in Egypt got worse. Between 1951 and 1952, 30 had been killed and over 60 had been wounded. The Egyptian police, who were meant to be supporting troops in maintaining law and order, were feeding information to the resistance movement of British troop whereabouts. This made life extremely difficult for the Brit British army in Egypt. Um, and in 1952, Operation Eagle was introduced. This was a full crackdown on the Egyptian police. However, it only took one incident to spark off the uh, full-scale rebellion. And this happened at Ismailia. The 3rd Infantry Brigade surrounded the police headquarters at Ismailia and called on the men inside it to surrender. After brief talks, the police within the building refused to do so and made it plain that they were prepared to fight. The British brought in Centurion tanks and other armored vehicles and attacked. The police headquarters was taken over. 
There were some British casualties, but 50 Egyptian police were killed and many more were wounded. Over 800 men were arrested and taken into custody. A local man photographed of what he saw and the photos when published only served to inflame an already very tense situation. What happened at Ishmaelia angered many throughout the whole of Egypt. The men in the police headquarters were armed with World War II Lee Enfield rifles, while the British used tanks to smash their way into the building. The next day after the British attack, Black Saturday, uh, that's how it was referred to, there were riots throughout Egypt. The next day after the British attack, sorry, the Union flag was burned and foreign shops were destroyed. In Cairo, expatriate accommodation was attacked. Uh, that means that uh, British citizens that, that lived in, uh, in Egypt, uh, uh, well, the, their places of lodging were attacked. Uh, as was the iconic Shepherd's Hotel, a base for British expatriates. At the exclusive Turf Club in Cairo, expatriate members were beaten to death and the club was des destroyed. In all over, uh, 700 buildings were destroyed and nine British and 26 other Westerners were killed. It is generally accepted that this outbreak of violence was not planned but was a spontaneous outpouring of anger by people who had been treated as second-class citizens within their own country. Few Egyptians could afford luxuries uh, that existed at places like the Shepherd's Hotel or uh, the Turf Club. Those who, could, those who could were invariably associated with the corrupt government of King Farouk. Anthony Eden um, wanted 40,000 troops moved into Egypt within 24 hours to restore order and to protect the British there. The army made it plain to Eden that this was simply not possible from a logistical point of view. While it was a clear sign that Eden had little understanding of issues such as logistics, the issue was left with army chiefs being told that they were leaving British citizens unprotected. What happened at Ismailia and what followed gave Nasser and the free officers exactly the right opportunity to overthrow Farouk. The king was peacefully removed from his palace, taken to Alexandria, where he boarded his yacht and left Egypt to a 21-gun salute. Nasser immediately set up the Revolutionary Command Council. Though Nasser did not head the council, it was obvious that the most potent force in it was Nasser. This all happened against the background when the British government was having major financial troubles at home. The cost of the military commitment to Egypt was huge and one that the Treasury could have done without. Eden took the decision to start negotiations with the Revolutionary Command Council to withdraw British troops from the Suez Canal. The so-called Suez Group in the Conservative, in the conservative Party uh, back in England was furious when his plan was announced. Led by Julian Amory, the Suez Group argued that a withdrawal would be the end of the empire and that it would reward violence against British troops. Regardless of their objections, Eden went ahead with the negotiations. However, the speed of the negotiations was not quick enough for Egyptian nationalists. Attacks on British troops continued, but a new dynamic was added with attacks on the families of troops occurring. With, 20, with 27,000 British citizens in Egypt, this was a new and worrying development. The resistance leaders used the talks to their advantage. When the British seemed to be stalling, the attacks got worse. When the British appeared to be more conciliatory, the, uh, they slackened off. In 1954, an agreement was reached that stated that British troops would leave Egypt within 20 months of the signing of the agreement. The signing of this agreement ended the attacks on, the, on British troops. Uh, Nasser and Eden met for the first and last time in February 1955. Eden arrived in Cairo with two objectives. The first was for Egypt to stop its anti-British radio broadcast, and the second was to get Egypt to join the recently formed Baghdad Pact, 
an anti-communist pro-Western alliance of Middle East states that Egypt had not joined. He failed on both counts. Even the dinner put on, put on for Nasser at the British Embassy was a failure as Nasser arrived in military uniform to be greeted by Eden in full evening dress. Nasser was unaware that the dinner was to be formal, and he concluded that it had been done to show him up in public. Uh, there's no evidence that this was the case. It just seems to have been a genuine, genuine misunderstanding. But within the context of what was going on then, uh, to those Egyptians who had access to the information via the radio channel Voice of Egypt, uh, it was a deliberate attempt to humiliate NASA. One week after the meeting between Eden and Nasser, Israel raided Egyptian territory in Gaza, killing over 30 people. This raid exposed Egypt's military weakness, and Nasser attempted to buy weapons abroad. His attempt to buy weapons from Britain failed, and the Americans were also unwilling to accommodate him. Therefore, Egypt turned to the Soviet uh, bloc. To the Russians, this expansion of influence Mediterranean and Middle East was a major coup. To modernize Egypt, Nasser wanted to build a dam at Aswan to harness the awesome power of the River Nile. Clearly, Egypt did not have the money to fund this. $200 million came from the World Bank while, in an effort to reestablish some influence in the area, both Britain and America agreed to financially support the project. However, Eden did not trust Nasser. In a public broadcast, he had stated that Nasser is not a man to be trusted to keep an agreement. MI6, which is the British uh, Secret Intelligence Service, uh, provided Eden, now Prime Minister, with reports that Nasser was becoming more pro-Moscow. There was little evidence for this, despite the Soviet Union uh, providing Egypt with weapons. Both seemed to be using the other for its own purposes. Uh, however, the MI6 reports only served to anger Eden, who did not want to gain an athlete reputation for appeasement. When British troops finally left Egypt, it ended 74 years of occupation. Nasser became president of Egypt, and his status in the Arab world could not have been higher. However, without any reference to Britain, America suddenly announced that it was no longer going to financially support the Aswan Dam project. Britain followed the Americans' example. Nasser announced that such treatment of Egypt was an insult and a humiliation, because the, the British and the Americans had broken their word. To Nasser, the dam would be a symbol of Arab pride, and he was determined to go ahead with its building. The Russians provided the necessary engineering knowledge, while the Suez Canal uh, would provide the necessary finance, now that it was nationalized. In 1956, Nasser announced to his inner council that he was going to nationalize the, the Suez Canal on behalf of the Egyptian people. In Operation Dignity and Glory, the offices of the Suez Canal Company were taken over. Uh, it was a bloodless affair that was joyously received in Egypt when news of, the, when news of what had occurred was announced. Ironically, government lawyers for the conservative government uh, back in Great Britain from 1951 through 1953 had foreseen this and had assessed whether it was a legal move. They decided that under international law, it was legal to nationalize the Suez Canal, as long as they suitably compensated shareholders and allowed ships of all nationalities through the canal. When Eaton was shown the report of it at his first meeting after Dignity and Glory, staff uh, present there claimed he shouted, this is no fucking good and threw the report across the room. What followed were diplomatic talks, some secret, that all led to the invasion of Port Said in November 56 um, by, by 
these rape forces. Okay. Nasser, having nationalized the Suez Canal, waited to see what would happen. Uh, Nasser confidently predicted that Britain would not use military force to reclaim the Suez Canal and that dip diplomacy would not work. Therefore, he concluded that, this, that his gamble over the Suez Canal had worked. On August 8, 1956, Anthony Eden went on television to explain his policy towards Egypt. He told the British public that our quarrel is not with Egypt, still less with the Arab world. It is with Colonel Nasser. He is not a man who can be trusted to keep an agreement. During the speech, Eden compared Nasser to the recent fascist leaders of Europe, a comparison that did not go down well in the Arabic world. In August 1956, 20,000 reservists were called up in Britain. Men were sent to Malta and uh, Cyprus as the two obvious forward military bases. Britain drew up in secret plans to recapture the Suez Canal and to force through a change of regime in Egypt. Eden's main advisor at the Foreign Office on Egyptian issues was Adam Watson. He got the clear impression that Eden believed that the Egyptian people would welcome a strong but benevolent British government in Egypt, a throwback to the days of the British Empire at its peak. The United States of America made it clear that it was against any form of military action and Dwight Eisenhower made this clear in communications with Eden. The American Secretary of State at the time was John Foster Dulles. It was Dulles who had frequent contact, contact with Eden, and his messages to the Prime Minister were ambivalent and far from clear. If Eden believed that America was not against military action as a result of his meetings with Dulles, with Dulles uh, this may well have been encouraged him to not only think about it, but also to actively follow it up. Eden got the full backing of France for action against Egypt, especially from the French foreign Min minister, Christian, Christian Friedel. Nasser had helped Algerian rebels against the ruling French government in Algiers, and this Pirot could not tolerate. Nasser backed up his stance when he publicly stated, it is our duty to help our Arab brothers. So his, he was clearly an internationalist. A third nation covertly made its feeling plan on the topic of Egypt, uh, Israel. Officials from France and Israel met in secret to discuss what could be done against Egypt. Israel was greatly concerned by Egypt's military power that was becoming greater as a result of Czech military imports. On July 27, France had openly asked Israel if they were considering attacking Egypt in what would be a preemptive strike, attack before being attacked. Shimon Peres told the French that an Israeli attack could take place within two weeks of the 27th, but that modern weapons were needed. In response to this, France secretly exported to Israel modern weaponry. Because of a trade embargo on military equipment to the Middle East, uh, the landing of this equipment took place at night. Moshe Dayan was there to observe the landings near Haifa. Uh, as a result of his concern for what was going on in the Middle East, Eisenhower ordered U-2 spy planes to fly over the Israel Egypt area to give US intelligence more of a clear picture as to what military equipment both sides had. The results greatly angered Eisenhower. The photos showed that Israel had been equipped with 60 French Mystère fighter planes, whereas the French government had told Eisenhower that they had only handed over to Israel 12 Mystères. Eisenhower saw the planes as changing the balance of power in the region and that such a move could provoke a response. On October 13th, Eden addressed the Conservative Party conference at Landudna. Eden clearly stated that he did not rule out the, the use of military force. However, he also knew that in, he had to do something decisive as little had been seemingly done since the nationalization of the Suez Canal in July.
On October 14, Eden met the French Deputy Chief of Staff at Chequers. It was at this meeting that there was the first mention of a possible military input by the Israelis. The French plan was to get Israel to attack Egypt across the Sinai Desert. As Israel moved nearer to the Suez Canal, Britain and France would call on both forces to withdraw 10 miles both sides of the Suez Canal. Egypt to the west and Israel to the east. And both nations would send in troops to ensure the safety of this vital international waterway. On October 16, Eden told the French that the plan had his support. Secrecy was paramount and America was not told. The three nations involved met at a remote villa at Sevres, Sevres near Paris. Ben Gurion, Shimon Peres, and Moshe Dayan made the secret journey from Israel to the villa, while the British representative there was the Foreign Secretary, Selwyn Lloyd. The meeting did not go well. Gurion wanted Britain to promise to intervene in the region 72 hours earlier than Britain had planned to do so. Lloyd refused to give such an assurance, and Ben Gurion was all for leaving the meeting. He was stopped when Shimon Peres told him that their plane had developed mechanical problems and that they would have to stay at the villa to ensure that their presence there remained secret. As a result, the talk continued. On October 23rd, Pierrot uh, flew to London to see Eden. Sort, uh, sorry. Pierrot flew to London to see Eden to sort out the problems. On the following day, Eden sent Patrick Dean to Paris. Dean was the chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee, and his task was to ensure that any Israeli attack actually seemed as if it was going to threaten the Suez Canal. Therefore, in the eyes of the world, Britain and France would be justified in sending in troops. Dean signed a document that confirmed all the details. He brought a copy back to Eden, who was horrified that anything had been put in writing as this. Eden believed, jeopardized, uh, well, as this jeopardized the whole secrecy of the mission. On October 28th, Israel launched a secret strike on Egypt. So secret that for years the Egyptians had no idea as to what had happened. Israeli intelligence had found out via a spy when and where an aeroplane uh, carrying senior Egyptian military commanders would be flying. It was shot down, killing all on board. Many in Egypt believed it to have been a tragic accident. At the same time, 12 French fighters 12 French fighter jets uh, flew from Cyprus to Israel. And uh, Moshe Dayan was concerned about the aerial strength of the Egyptian Air Force, and the French fighters were a guarantee against this. The fighter planes were given Israeli markings, and the French pilots given the appropriate documentation. On October 29th, uh, 395 Israeli paratroopers were dropped in the Sinai Desert about 20 miles from the Suez Canal. Eden had expected a larger force, and the attack even, pulled, even puzzled NASA, who was informed that the Israelis seemed to be going from one sand hill to another with no obvious strategic cohesion to what they were doing. On October 30th, Eden informed the House of Commons and the Queen of what had happened in the Sinai. The Israeli and Egyptian ambassadors were summoned and told to inform their respective governments that both forces should withdraw 10 miles either side of the Suez Canal to ensure that the canal was not damaged. Nasser rejected this, and it was this that gave Britain and France the excuse to start an attack. The United Nations called on all sides not to use violence in the attempts to solve the problem. Britain used its right of veto in the Security Council to reject this. Britain started its attack when RAF bombers attacked the International Airport in Cairo. Eisenhower was furious, and he made his anger known in public when he said, we believe this, these actions to be taken in error. However, his comments did not stop the bombings. On November 1st, more British aerial bombings destroyed many MiG-15 fighters on the ground. 
in Britain even faced embarrassment from one of his own uh, members of parliament, William Yates. He had found out about the secret plan to attack Egypt. However, Yates had no details about it. Uh, if he had, Eden could have been in far more political trouble than he was, as it would have been obvious that Britain and France were trying to, precip to precipitate a situation in which they could attack as opposed to avoiding one. The attack on Egypt was scheduled for November 5th. Um, and then the um, Suez crisis, crisis of uh, 1956 ensued. Um, events in Egypt, um, the nationalization of the Suez Canal and the increasing heroic status of Nasser made the conflict look inevitable. On November 3rd, 1956, Anthony Eden prepared to address the nation. By now, it was clear to those around him that Eden's health was suffering. The director of the broadcast, David Attenborough, stated he looked dreadful, very ill. At the start of his address, Eden stated, all my life, I have been a man of peace. I still have the same devotion to peace. However, in the same speech, Eden then went on, Eden then went on that now was the right time to stand firm and that action was required to undo what Nasser had done with regards to the Suez Canal. In Egypt, civilians were given rifles in an effort to produce a makeshift militia that would support the army. The military in Cairo fully expected a full-scale Anglo-French invasion and wanted as many to help as was physically possible. On November 4th, a major demonstration was held in London with regards to the military buildup. The demonstration was organized by the Labour Party and the most common banner on display was Law Not War. The main speaker at Trafalgar Square was Anurin Vega. The man credited with founding the National Health Service said, if he is sincere in what he's, in what he's saying, then he's too stupid to be Prime Minister, referring to Eden. The demonstration turned more unpleasant and the police were needed to restore order near 10 down, down the street. In Cairo, Nasser saw images of the demonstration. He turned to a colleague and said, Eden is weak, weak in character. Diplomatically, the course of events seemed to be turning against Eden. It appeared as if the Israelis were going to accept the United Nations proposal for a ceasefire. Even Eden's cabinet was split on what course of action should be taken. The main opponent to military action was the leader of the house, uh, Rav Butler. When it became clear that Israel was not going to accept the UN ceasefire proposal, the cabinet decided the military action would start. In theory, the action by the armed forces should have been easy, as the Israelis had tied up a lot of the Egyptian army in the Sinai. On November 5th, ironically, gunpowder plot day in Britain Men from the 3rd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment took off for the El Gamil airfield to the west of Port Said. At 5 a.m., the first men landed at the airfield. 668 paratroopers went, were to parachute into El Gamil in total. The paratroopers faced a mixture of civilians and army fighters. French paratroopers with some British in support landed, landed to the west of Port Said. At El Gamil, the resistance put up by the Egyptians was greater than expected, and three uh, para took more casualties than had been anticipated. Uh, I believe that's referring to the, to the parachute uh, brigade that the British had. Uh, from El Gamil, Three para moved on Port Said itself at the mouth of the Suez Canal. The Royal Air Force gave the men fighter cover as they moved. Despite fierce resistance in the cemetery near Port Said, the British force had a successful first day. However, on that day, a, later, a letter was received in London, but not shown to the sleeping uh, uh, Eden until the following day uh, from Bulgaria. 
uh, the Soviet Union's prime minister. As Suez was played out in the background of the uh, Soviet uh, invasion of Hungary, seeming Soviet involvement was a worrying occurrence. Bolgenin made it clear that, that the Soviet Union would take action against any aggressors in Egypt. In the era of the Cold War, and with the world reeling from the Soviet invasion of Hungary, it would have been expected that Britain's primary ally at the time, the United States of America, would have rallied to support Great Britain. This didn't happen. In fact, the opposite happened. Dwight Eisenhower um, was campaigning to be reelected as president of the United States. The global image of an American ally acting like an imperial bully against a nation that probably probably couldn't protect itself against such a force was unacceptable to Eisenhower. He had already told Eden that the use of force was unaccept unacceptable. In a letter to Eisenhower, Eden wrote, history alone can judge whether we have made the right decision. Militarily, day one went as well as could have been expected. Diplomatically, things were not going well for the British. On November 6th, the sea landings took place in support of the paratroopers on the ground. At 4 a.m., guns from Royal Navy ships started to pound known defenses in Port Said. At 4.45, men from 40 and 42 commandos, Royal Marines, started their assault on Port Said. 45 commando went in uh, via helicopters. Faced with a combination of British and French paratroopers, British commandos, and the Israeli army in Sinai, it seemed obvious to many that the Egyptian forces would not last for long. However, on the same day, politics started to take its toll. The chancellor of the ex exchequer, Harold Macmillan, told the cabinet meeting that there was a run on sterling, especially in New York and the Britain faced the real prospect of having to devalue sterling and also faced the possibility of an Arab oil embargo. Both would have, both would have a major impact, a negative impact, on the British economy. This was also coupled with the prospect of United Nations sanctions. Eisenhower had also made it clear to his cabinet that America would not do anything to prop up sterling, um, which is, uh, silver, I, I believe, until Britain had, and France had started to withdraw their forces from Egypt. Faced with the possibility of a major dent in the UK economy, the cabinet took the decision to order a ceasefire. By the end of November 6, Port Said had been taken, and the military estimated that full control of the Suez Canal would only take another 24 hours. However, they were ordered to stop fighting at midnight on the same day. By November 7, casualty figures could be assessed. It is believed that about 650 Egyptians were killed, including civilians, with 2,000 wounded. The Anglo-French forces lost 26 men killed and 129 wounded. Included, included in these figures were Royal Marines killed and wounded in, in a friendly fire incident involving the, the Royal Air Force. There was little doubt that Britain had been humiliated on the international scene. However, Eden remained defiant. On November 17th, he said, we make no apology and will never make one for the actions which we took. On, on December 20th, in the House of Commons, Eden was asked if he had ever had prior knowledge of an Israeli attack preceding a British or French attack. Eden told the House that he had not, clearly misleading the House on what, on what he actually did know. However, his health was failing. British troops started to withdraw on December 23rd. On January 8th, 1957, Eden addressed his cabinet for the last time. He gave his reason for resigning his increasingly poor health. The Queen accepted his resignation on January 9th and Harold Macmillan succeeded him. In Egypt and in the whole Arab world, Nasser became a hero, idolized by millions. He was seen as the man who had stood up to the imperial ambitions of Britain and France and had defeated them. Um, okay, and then uh, later, um, uh, there came the Six Day War, um, a 
approximately 10 years uh, down the road, uh, which uh, took place in June 1967. The Six-Day War was fought between June 5th and June 10th. The Israelis defended the war as a preventative military effort to counter what the Israelis saw as an impending attack by Arab nations that surrounded Israel. The Six-Day War was initiated by General Moshe Dayan, the Israeli defense minister. The war was against Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. Israel believed that it was only a matter of time before the three Arab states coordinated a massive attack on Israel. After the 1956 Suez Crisis, uh, the United Nations had established a presence in the Middle East, especially at sensitive border areas. The United Nations was only there with the agreement of the nations that acted as a host to it. By May 1967, the Egyptians had made it clear that the United Nations was no longer wanted the Suez region. Gamal Nasser ordered a concentration of Egyptian military forces in the sensitive Suez uh, Canal zone. This was a highly provo provocative act, and the Israelis only viewed it one way, that Egypt was preparing to attack. The Egyptians had also enforced a naval blockade, which closed off the Gulf of Aqaba to Israeli shipping. Rather than wait to be attacked, the Israelis launched a hugely successful military campaign against its perceived enemies. Um, the air forces of Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and Iraq were all but destroyed on June 5th. By June 7th, Many Egyptian tanks had been destroyed in the Sinai Desert, and Israeli forces reached the Suez Canal. On the same day, the whole of the west bank of the Jordan River had been cleared of Jordanian forces. The Golan Heights were captured from Syria, and Israeli forces moved 30 miles into Syria itself. The war was a disaster for the Arab world and temporarily weakened the man who was seen as the leader of the Arabs, uh, Gamal Abdul Nasser. Uh, the war was a military disaster for the Arabs, but it was also a massive blow to the Arabs' morale uh, and to uh, pan-Arabism. Here were four of the strongest Arab nations systematically defeated by just one nation. As background to this, I'd like to point out that um, since um, Nasser had made a calculated bet that, well, to, to support the Yemeni revolution, he had committed about 70,000 troops um, to, to the fight in Yemen to support the Republicans there. And um, some, some claim that it, that it may have been a decisive factor in, the, in how, how well the Six Day War came out or yeah so um, but but in his mind it was it was necessary to support the Yemeni uh, revolution um, because of the of the because of the um, failure of the United, United Arab, no, the Union of Arab Republics um, th that was very short-lived uh, for about three years between Syria and Egypt. And so, uh, in his mind, it, it, was, it was the right move. The success of the campaign must have surprised the Israelis. However, it also gave them a major pro problem that was to prove a major problem for the Israeli government for decades. By capturing the Sinai, the Golan Heights, and the West Bank of the Jordan River, 
the Israelis had captured for themselves areas of great strategic value. However, the West Bank also contained over 600,000 Arabs who now came under Israeli administration. Their plight led many young Arabs into joining the Palestinian Liberation Organization, a group that the Israelis deemed a terrorist organization. Israeli domestic policies became a lot more complicated after the military successes of June 1967. Um, the Palestinian Liberation Organization was actually uh, a movement that, the, a national liberation movement uh, led by Yasser Arafat. Uh, so, that pretty much, uh, I'm in close to the uh, end of my lecture. Uh, okay, and, and just to just to uh, confirm what, what I mentioned earlier about uh, NASA's uh, um, calculated bet in support of the Yemenis. Um, Nasser's considerations for sending troops uh, there may have included, uh, number one, the impact of his support to the Algerian War of Independence from 1954 to 1962. Number two, Syria breaking up from Nasser's United Arab Republic in 1961. Number three, taking advantage of a breach in uh, British and French relations, which had been strained by Nasser's support for the FLN in Algeria, FLN uh, being the Front de Liberación Nacional, which was the National Liberation Front, um, and primarily for his efforts to undermine the Central Treaty Organization, uh, CENTO, which uh, caused the downfall of the Iraqi monarchy in 1958. Number four, confronting imperialism, which Nasser saw as Egypt's destiny. Number five, guaranteeing dominance of the Red Sea from the Suez Canal all the way down to the Bab el Mandeb Strait, which is right around the tip of the, the Gulf of Aden um, in southern Yemen. Number six, um, achieving retribution against the Saudi royal family, uh, whom Nasser felt had undermined his union with Syria. Nasser had a very clear vision for modernizing Egypt. Uh, he identified five targets that he wanted to address. Poverty in Egypt, ignorance in Egypt, national oblivion, neglect of Egypt's infrastructure, and no sense of national identity or pride in Egypt. He was also keen to see Egypt free of any overtones of colonialism, a belief that was to bring him into direct conflict with Britain and France in 1956. To support his beliefs, Nasser did what he could to restore national pride to all Arab nations, not just Egypt. The most obvious source of a foreign power being dominant in Egypt was the British-French control of the Suez Canal. Uh, completed in, in 1869, the canal was designed by Ferdinand de Lesseps. However, the vast bulk of the physical labor that was required to build this engineering marvel was done by Egyptian nationals. Britain had a 40% holding in the company that ran the canal. However, despite the fact that the canal was on Egyptian soil, the benefits it brought the people of Egypt were minimal. In 1956, um, Nasser nationalized the canal, provoked, uh, some would say provoking an attack by the French and the British on Egypt. This attack was condemned at an international level and the British and French had to withdraw their forces when it became clear that America did not support what they had done. Um, 
Nasser's stand against two major European powers brought him huge popularity not just in Egypt, but also in, in all Arab nations. After this success, Nasser set about the Egyptianization of his country. Uh, one of the most pressing problems Egypt faced on an annual basis was the flooding of the River Nile, which could dis decimate fertile farming land. Nasser's plan was to build a dam to hold back the mighty waters of the Nile, which would also provide Egypt with hydroelectric power. Neither Britain nor France could have been asked to assist in the project, as in America, who openly supported Israel, was politically impossible for Nasser. Hence, he turned to America's Cold War enemy, the Soviet Union. The USSR provided the capital and the engineers for the huge project. Egypt and the USSR were curious bedfellows. One was a Muslim nation, while the other, a communist nation, had banned all forms of religion and had shut down all places of religious worship. However, for Nasser, the the Russians provided Egypt with what they needed after the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development had withdrawn its financial support for the project after 1956. For Russia, there was the opportunity to gain a foothold in the Mediterranean Sea. The Black Sea fleet was trapped in the Black Sea and its movements were easily made known to the Americans. Egypt offered a way around this problem. Nasser also made gains in other areas of domestic policy. Under Negwe, um, which was the first Egyptian president, civilian titles as associated with the royal family were banned. Privileges associated with the old way were also banned. Laws were brought in that limited the amount of land someone could own, and they also widened the opportunities for land ownership. In 1961, Nasser nationalized a number of corporations so that the wealth that they generated could be used to improve the lifestyle of the Egyptian people. One year later, a decision was announced that Egypt would be run on Arab socialist lines. Um, okay, so this is, this is the time when, when uh, he proposed the, uh, uh, the agrarian reform. Uh, uh, in Egypt. In 19, well, one year later, in 1962, a decision was announced that Egypt, well, sorry, <laughs> accidentally backtracked. During Nasser's time in office, the Aswan High Dam was completed. This was a project that generated worldwide attention. However, iron and steel mills, aluminum plants, car and food factories were also built. Uh, in total, over 2,000 new factories were built in Egypt during Nasser's time. So there was a, a great deal of indust industrialization of uh, the country. However, Nasser, uh, as I just mentioned, suffered a major blow when Egypt and other Arab nations were beaten by Israel in the Six Day War. By this year, Egypt was seen as the leading Arab nation, and the Arab people looked to Egypt for leadership. For Nasser, the comprehensive defeat by Israel was a serious blow, and he offered his resignation. Um, this was rejected by the people who took to the streets in massive numbers. Uh, millions went out into the streets um, after he, he made his uh, uh, after he, he was willing to, uh, uh, to offer his resignation. And so, uh, after the people took to the streets to demonstrate their support for him, um, he changed his mind and continued being president until 1970. After the war, Nasser went to great efforts to modernize the Egyptian military and this remained one of his primary aims until his death on September 28, 1970. His death was followed by an outpouring of national grief in Egypt. Nasser was succeeded by Anwar Sadat. Um, with, Nasser, with Nasser's death in 1970, the CIA established a back channel to his successor, Anwar Sadat. 
through Saudi intelligence chief Kamal Adam, transmitting, Kissinger, transmitting uh, the US Secretary of State Henry Kissinger's uh, promises to Sadat that Washington would assist Egypt against Israel if he broke off relations with the Soviet Union, which he did in 1972 to consolidate his position against the Nasserites and pro-Soviet left, Sadat entered into an alliance with the Muslim Brotherhood and allowed Egypt to become a center for Islamic pol political activism, declaring Islam the state religion and later adopting provisions for Sharia law into the Constitution. Good as his word, Kissinger restrained Israel enough during the October War in 1973 to engineer a stalemate and Washington supported the new Egyptian regime with millions in annual economic aid. With political Islam flourishing across Saudi Arabia and Egypt, the stage was set for Washington's crucial role in organizing the first global jihad. Uh, okay, and um, just to give you an idea of what uh, Sadat's reign was during the 1970s. Um, there's a, uh, a leading um, Egyptian feminist uh, writer, psychiatrist, and human rights activist uh, by the name of Nawal El Sadawi, um, who, who puts it much better uh, here. In her words, the people in Tahrir Square, the millions of men and women who made the revolution, and who are continuing the revolution, they know what the United States did to us since Sadat. Sadat and the United States ruined the economy of Egypt. They ruined our dignity by aid, American aid. And we said from the be beginning, we don't accept American aid. We need free trade and not aid. They brought the fundamentalists, because usually, as I say, bin Laden and George Bush are twins. Sadat and Mubarak and America and Israel are, well, they encourage the most fanatic Islamic and Christian and Jewish fundamentalism to divide us, to fight against socialists and feminists. So we are aware of, US, of the US role in Egypt. US government since Reagan, since all of George Bush and uh, Barack Obama. They ruined our economy. And they gave us aid, so-called aid, uh, which went to the pockets of regime people, men and women, and to the United States again. So we are not, we were not deceived by what America, uh, the US government did to us. And what we say to US government is keep away from Egypt, keep away, and Amer end American neo-colonialism, end your 100% support to Israelis killing the Palestinians, and your false democracy, and your hypocrisy. Now they are confused, but we are fed up with neo-colonialism and interference in our affairs. Now Egypt is a new Egypt, independent Egypt, dignified Egypt, not accepting aid. We're going to depend on our production, agricultural production, industrial production. We are regaining our dignity and freedom and justice. And Thank you all for your patience. <laughs> Sorry for the length of this uh, lecture. But um, in closing, I would like to quote an internationalist uh, comrade, Ernesto Che Guevara. Um, his exhortation echoes today more strongly than ever when he addressed the world at the General Assembly of the United Nations uh, on December 11, 1964. Yes. Now history will have to take the poor of America into account, the exploited and spurned of America, who have decided to begin writing their history for themselves for all time. And the wave of anger, of demands for justice, of claims for rights trampled underfoot, which is beginning to sweep the lands of Latin America, will not stop. That wave will swell with every passing day, for that wave is composed of the greatest numbers, the majorities in every respect, those whose labor amasses the wealth and turns the wheels of history. 
Now they are awakening from the long, brutalizing sleep to which they had been subjected. For this great mass of humanity has said enough and has begun to march. And their march of giants will not be halted until they conquer true independence, for which they have vainly died more than once. Today, however, those who die will die like the Cubans at Plaza Giron. They will die for their own true and never to be surrendered independence. That's the end.